part to show up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the ASLA Emerging Professionals Committee Ask Me Anything events. We are so excited to have you here with us today. My name is Daniel Martin of Permalock Corporation and I am the chair of the Emerging Professionals Committee and I will be your host and moderator today. So we are so excited to have with us Nina Chase of River Life in Pittsburgh and we're going to let her introduce herself and talk a little bit but I want to encourage you all to use the comment section uh, on Facebook, Facebook Live, to enter any questions that you may have for Nina over the course of the next hour, and we'll try to get to as many as we can and answer all that we can. So without further ado, allow me to introduce Nina Chase, and we're going to let her uh, open up and tell you a little bit about herself and what she's doing these days. Nina? Thanks, Daniel. Um, well, thank you also to the, um, the American Society of Landscape Architects for the Emerging Professionals Committee. This is an awesome program that you guys do, so I'm really excited to be here and to participate. Um, my name is Nina Chase, and I'm the Senior Project Manager at River Life in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a proud Appalachian. I'm born, raised, educated almost entirely in West Virginia. Uh, I was born in Morgantown, West Virginia, about an hour and a half south of Pittsburgh. Uh, and I did my my bachelor's in educated architecture almost at entirely West in West Virginia. Uh, and then I went up in Morgantown, Cambridge, West Virginia, and I did my master's an hour and a half south of architecture at Harvard at the Graduate School of Design. Um, and then I worked in the Boston area for about four and a half years. Uh, and until about a year ago, I was an associate at Sasaki in Boston, where I worked. Um, I worked as a landscape architect on a lot of urban design projects. So within the teams. I worked with, I focused on the design and planning of the, of the urban landscapes, the public realms of projects. Um, and then last year around this time, almost a year ago, I uh, returned to my, my regional roots to Pittsburgh um, to continue really working at the intersection of landscape architecture and urban design. Uh, and I'm the senior project manager at River Life in Pittsburgh and River Life is a nonprofit and we're focused on developing all the public spaces along Pittsburgh's three rivers. So the, we have three rivers, uh, the Monongahela and the Allegheny and they merge in the city to form the Ohio. So we're kind of the gateway to the West. Um, and in my position here at River Life, I direct our planning and implementation projects. So any planning work that we're doing, visioning um, or construction of actual park projects. Um, and I work with a whole slew of folks in the city, city officials, nonprofit leaders from other groups, community advocates, designers, um, and we're all working to transform Pittsburgh's riverfronts into the kind of hub of the city. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing these days. <laughs> so just a little bit busy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a few things here and there. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Yeah. Well, we are going to get started with some questions. So we have at yeah. these AMAs six standard questions that we uh, start off everyone okay. with. So we yeah. are going to throw those out at you first while we wait for Sounds some good. comments to come in from viewers and questions from viewers. Okay. So if you're watching, be sure to type in your questions in the comments section. All right. So let's start off with this, Nina. If there was one thing you wish you could tell your younger landscape architect self, what would that be? Not that you're not young still, <laughs> but, but you're even younger self. What would you tell yourself? Yes, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so, well, it's funny. I was just at Labash giving a presentation, and um, you were there, so you heard this. But yep. I think probably the, the biggest thing I would have liked to have heard more of is put down my portfolio. I, I think I spent a little too much time finagling the uh, you know the outline of my portfolio and the the margin the edges and the sizes and the fonts and things um, and I wish someone had just said you know put down the portfolio instead spend your time meeting the folks who you want to meet who could potentially give you a job um, and I think this is applicable to anyone at any point in their career obviously when you're in a position as a landscape architect going out and meeting people in the community who could potentially give you work as a landscape architect um, is appropriate. And then when you're a student or an emerging professional, 
getting to know really the the movers and the shakers and the people who are out there in the community doing the things that you want to do, go meet them, um, you know, email them, ask them for coffee, even if they intimidate you, like, just be comfortable asking them um, for advice. A lot of people are very willing to do this as long as you are polite and uh, <laughs> and nice about it. So I would I would recommend that, and I do recommend that to any student who's out there looking for work, you know, looking for a summer internship. Um, and I I know that that probably would have made me feel a little bit more relaxed about uh, my position when I was in school um, if someone had just told me to put the portfolio down for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that is great yeah. advice. Um, and yeah. through the committee, one of the things we do, we are visiting a lot of schools as part of the ASLA Leadership Visit Series. And I think you're yes, asking yeah. students to um, talk to people. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's brilliant. So many yeah. times students seem to be intimidated um, by leaders. Yeah, or... and I was, I'm, I remember, yeah. <laughs> yes. And I, I, it's um, it's one of those, you just got to get over it and you just ask, ask people for their advice, ask them for a cup of coffee, buy the coffee for them, take them out. Um, or just meet them at their office. And most people are very willing and, and accessible. Um, yeah. For sure. If there's one thing I've learned about landscape architects, they're extremely friendly. <laughs> they're people, people, people. Yes. So and it's, it's such a, it's exactly. It's such a small profession. Once you start to build your network, it starts to magnify pretty quickly. Um, and I think that's a real asset because it is so small. You can really have an impact early on if you want to if you want to, and you can meet the right people, um, but you just have to be willing to put yourself out there a little bit. And I, I think also what I tell students often is that people hire people. You know, if you're sending emails to an info at, you know, whatever firm it is, dot com, you're probably not doing it right. Um, you need to actually meet the folks who will be reviewing your portfolio and hiring you. And um, that requires, you know, putting yourself out there to meet those folks. Uh, and even if that's a phone call or an email, those are probably the easiest ways to do it. Or at volunteer events, go volunteer for something and meet them there, show your skills in a setting that way. Um, usually as a student, you have a little bit more free time. So it's a good um, use of your time. That's great. And a uh, little plug for ASLA. ASLA events are a great place yes, to do that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right. So let's move to question number two. Um, this one is who or what has had the biggest impact on your career so far? Yeah, that's a, um, also a very good question. <laughs> um, I would say when, what is probably more applicable because uh, when I realized that um, one person isn't shouldn't be responsible for everything in a design and recognizing that really partnerships are the key to, to making any good project get off the ground. Uh, I think that for me unlocked so much potential and allowed me to ask my friends for advice, ask me to uh, ask my professional colleagues to partner on projects. Um, and I think uh, Doing that enables you to work in skills that you might not have, um, that might be not be your strengths, uh, but allows you to, um, you know, really create depth into a project or even get a project off the ground if you get the right people in the room. Uh, and I think that that probably has had the biggest impact on my career, in in the sense of just kind of unlocking the potential of the profession and the potential of the work that landscape architects can do if you if you partner with the right people. Very good. All right. Partnerships are important. Everything seems to be coming back to networking. You notice that? I know. It does. <laughs> I think, you know, in my head, it's always like 50-50. You need really good projects. You need to be a good designer. That's that. That's almost a, that's a given. You have to have your design chops up to a certain standard. And then on the other side, you also just have to you have to be meeting the right people, whether those are developers or city organizations that have land and have land ownership and can actually implement projects. I mean, that's half the battle for us at Riverfront or at River Life because we're working on Riverfront projects. Um, and often, we, I mean, we don't own any land. We don't have any legal jurisdiction. And so we have to partner with other people and we have to use our networks and our relationships to make projects happen. Um, and so. I think as a designer, you, you not only have to be a really fantastic designer, but you have to also have the network to support it, to allow you the opportunity to do the work that you want to do. Yeah. So following right up from that, um, besides being able to, to network and to um, work with people, are there any yeah. other traits or skills that every landscape architect should have? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it goes hand in hand with this um, communication skills at ever at, at in different ways. So communication either orally, so if you're talking to someone and that's where you're networking, or communication um, in the sense of drawing, so visual communication. Um, you know, not everyone's going to be the person out networking, trying to get new work or um, get, you're not always trying to get a new job. Uh, hopefully you have a job for a little while. Um, but the other side of communication is the visual communication because we don't actually build the projects unless you're a design build landscape architect. Our job is to communicate our design intent through drawing. So if you are able to communicate uh, well with pen and paper, uh, you know, um, that's where I think your skills as a designer um, uh, not only come through as clearly as possible, um, but it's, it's imperative. You have to do it, otherwise your designs don't get built the way that you want them to. Um, so I think communication overall, there are lots of facets of communication, but I think that um, probably that skill is the most important skill for a landscape architect. And I think we, I think what's great is that the profession really trains us to do that. I mean, we have to give presentations pretty constantly in school. I know in my undergrad graduate uh, career, we had to give presentations every every other day, presenting to our fellow classmates, to jurors. You know, you're writing papers, you're doing, you're communicating in many modes. So either it's an elevator pitch, or a, or it's a 20 minute presentation, or it's a competition board. All of these different modes of communication test your skills and teach you how to communicate in different ways. And I think um, the more you can do that, the better the better you will be once you're out in the world and, uh, as a practitioner. Yeah, I believe there was a design intelligence uh, report out a couple of years ago that said the number one thing that people look for when hiring is someone who can communicate. Yeah. The other skills can be right. called. There you go. Learned, <laughs> if you can communicate, yeah. that's, that's good. Right. All right, yep. let's move on to our next question. Still one of our canned questions. We do still have some coming in actually from Facebook, so we'll get to those. Oh, great. But if you're watching, yeah. uh, keep posting questions in the comments and we'll, we will get to them. All right, what to you, this is personal preference, what to you is the yep. best thing about being a landscape architect? Uh, I, you know, I really, I. I do love that every, I know it sounds so corny, but every day is really different. And I think that's one of the real true joys of the profession is that you can come in one day and spend the entire day with a set of markers uh, and be sketching, you know, high level design concepts. Um, or, or you can spend a day in countless meetings, <laughs> or you can spend a day outside in the field, either tagging trees or doing a site visit, testing soil, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, um, I love that, that it's never the same every single day. Um, I know lots of lots of people have jobs that are pretty similar and they can, they, in my opinion, might seem a little mundane, um, but in landscape architecture, you you really, it runs the gamut, so you can do anything, <laughs> anything that you really wanna do. Um, uh, and every day is pretty, uh, pretty different, <laughs> which I, it's nice, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Um... Yeah, fact, might was, drive some people a little crazy, but I think it's fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a definitely good a good thing with the profession is that you're, you're always doing something different. Every project is somewhat yeah. different. Every day of every project can be somewhat different. And and depending yeah. on where you go with the career, there's so many things landscape architects can do. I was just with the landscape right. architect who was in um, public service now for a parks department, and he was just dealing with a beached whale and how how to get rid of a beached whale. As a landscape right. architect, I never thought I would do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we know, I think what a real strength of the profession is that everybody who's trained as a landscape architect knows a lot about, or knows a little about almost everything. And so then what's fun is that you can decide where you want to really dig in and have an expertise. And so, uh, you know, when you're in your early stages of your career, getting exposure to a lot of different types of projects, maybe a lot of different types of firms too, that's a good approach to kind of understand uh, where you want to put yourself. And maybe it is dealing with beached whales on a <laughs> <laughs> regular basis, or you want to do more, you know, maybe you want to work for a nonprofit or you want to work for a private consulting firm, or you want to do um, an exclusively uh, residential landscapes in at it's nice because the profession has so many options and, and you can really find your own little niche. Uh, to jump ahead a little bit off of our starting yeah. questions, uh, you, you know, 
along that same vein, you're working at a nonprofit now, um, yeah. obviously in private practice. What are the differences in the day to day, or what are the overall differences in those two things? Yeah, um, I would say so. One of the biggest differences is I'm not a designer anymore. I don't I don't work day to day as a designer. Uh, I work almost more like a planner with a landscape architecture a set of landscape architecture glasses on. Um, and yeah, we have similar landscape architecture glasses. Uh, but um, it's nice because we, uh, as the nonprofit, we are the coalition builder in the city. And so we're, again, going, kind of going back to that partnership idea. River Life is the organization that brings all the stakeholders together for particular projects. And so my job is a lot more about communication, um, a lot more emails. I'm just writing emails all the time, meeting with people um, in different in different capacities in the city or in other nonprofits, um, and and then we hire landscape architects. So now being on the client side of things, um, kind of understanding more, which has been really interesting to be to be the client and to interface with lots of different landscape architects um, to understand the role that the landscape architect plays in that process. Um, and for me personally, what excited me about moving to the nonprofit world and to River Life um, was being a landscape architect at the table further upstream in the development process. So when we're having conversations about a blank site or the reuse of an existing site on the riverfront and the topic of stormwater comes up, I can be there to help, you know, at least direct generally where stormwater should be on the site um, and or if it's, you know, setbacks for widths of trails and things like that to be able to have the perspective that I have as a landscape architect that early in the process, it can really help to shape um, the bigger moves of urban projects in the city. And that for me has been just, it's been really eye-opening to see how landscape architecture is valued, why it's valued, who values it, who doesn't, um, and to hopefully be able to start changing people's perceptions around what we can do and what our skill set enables us to to do and what conversations we should be a part of more and more. So I'm, I'm encouraging more, <laughs> as many people as possible to say, um, not 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 leave private practice, but you know, if you're in private practice and you want to have more experiences, that volunteer for organizations that are you know advocacy groups for trails or water watersheds or park park departments. Um, there are lots of ways that we as landscape architects can become more um, active and and kind of a louder voice in the audience um, or at the at the table. Yeah. Do you think? Um as a landscape architect working as a client with landscape architecture firms, are you their dream client or their nightmare client? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm, I'm a dream client. I, I think what's good is that I know the process. So at least I understand, you know, when I send comments back, hopefully, I, I mean, not, I'm saying this, and I'll talk to my friends later, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I hope that because I know what the process is that at least I can provide feedback at the right time and not like right at the last minute or like, you know, um, really screw up the, the, <laughs> the flow of things. But I think it's good. I think it's a, a, a good thing that um, I I can empathize with them, <laughs> with them. And yeah. Great. All right. We've got two more questions we'll go through real quick that are our, our starting questions, and then we do have more coming in on Facebook. So if yeah. you're watching, Great. stay there. Keep keep asking your questions in the comments. We're going to get to you. All right. So this is a big source of, of much debate. Uh, hand drawing or computer graphics? Oh, okay. I was like, what? What's a source <laughs> of debate? Um, <laughs> Very touchy subject. Uh, I would say, I say both. So I always sketch by hand. I can't I have a hard time my, just mentally, I think, getting into like the process of really quick sketching. Um, I sketch in plan view and then I will, I, oh, I almost always do really, really rough 3D sketches with SketchUp or uh, Rhino. Um, SketchUp though, for me has always been just so simple. So, and I haven't had to, I'm, I'm never really creating crazy forms or anything. So um, SketchUp works for me for 3D sketching. And then I'll, I'll do all my graphics for like presentations on the computer. Um, it's just, uh, for me, it's been the most efficient form of production. But I, I can't uh, discount hand sketching at, as an early stage in the process, not only for drawings, but for organizing my thoughts around uh, presentations. Like I do a lot of storyboarding 
I'll write like a full outline in text and then kind of assign graphics and organize them on trace paper. Um, but I like to do that by hand. All right. Yeah. So both. <laughs> yeah, both. You're, I would say the both. Switzerland Short answer, of, both. Uh, <laughs> of deciding yeah. what kind of graphics. All right. Yeah. Last, uh, last standard question and then uh, we're going to move on. So this is okay. the Willy Wonka question. Uh, if you could okay. get a golden ticket to go to any landscape in the world tomorrow, where yeah. would you want to go? Oh, man. Um, well, oh, so, well, I've seen a lot of this on Facebook for my friends in California, and I know I'm, I'd probably be a little late if I left tomorrow, but the super bloom in California, um, the images of all the flowers that have been like just exploding all over Southern California because of the, the wetter weather, I would love to see that. I know that's not like a, a cultural landscape, but, or I mean, it is a cultural landscape, but it's not like a built landscape. Um, I would love to see that. I mean, it's, it'd be so cool since it's such a temporal thing and it's going to disappear so soon. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going up to Toronto in a couple weekends, uh, and I'm really excited to see the waterfront up there. So that will be really fun. I have never been to, I went to Toronto and like, but I've, um, now with my focus at river life being waterfronts and riverfronts, um, my husband and I did a big road trip to American, uh, river cities last spring before I started. So we saw all these different river cities. So it's been nice to kind of see other, other cities that have really incredible waterfronts and see what they've been doing right and um, kind of take take hints and cues from that. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to some audience questions and uh, All right. and see uh, what people want to know. So we're going to start with uh, Kevin Pfeiffer. Okay. Ask, Hi, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the emerging American cities will be? And will they be enhanced by our profession? Yes. So this is also part of my motivation to moving to Pittsburgh because I see it as one of the emerging American cities, along with other, uh, well, uh, just because I'm in the Rust Belt, other Rust Belt cities. Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking about Cincinnati. I'm thinking about Columbus, Indianapolis, um, in Detroit. I mean, I, it, all the cities that have had... Uh, and it'll take a while. Uh, obviously, this is not like a uh, one fix kind of thing. But I see the like traditional second tier cities having a real renaissance in the next next uh, decade or so. Um, and, you know, on a very personal level, moving to Pittsburgh, one was me coming closer to home. But at the same time, um, Boston, quite frankly, was unaffordable for me. I had a great job. Uh, my husband had a great job, but it was just so expensive to live in a city like Boston. Um, and, you know, every time I came back to a city like Pittsburgh, um, I saw that it also had incredible amenities, cultural amenities, recreational amenities, all the food, the drink, the fun things to do, um, but at half the price. And I've heard, I've you know, anecdotally, I have a lot of friends and a uh, um, colleagues who similarly have started to move to places, maybe either move back to places where they may have came from or are moving to towns that um, aren't New York or Boston or San Francisco, but are cities that have um, more space, uh, more economic uh, upward mobility. Um, and I think that's really exciting. And I think what's also exciting is that from, so to answer the second part of that question, as a landscape architect, I think these cities more and more are recognizing the value of landscape architecture. And I, I will say this in general for all urban areas um, in the US, the value of public space has increased dramatically. Um, not only are, are we as landscape architects, I think valued more, I think the physical form of public space, whether that's why, you know, having wider sidewalks or complete streets, thinking about bike lanes and park space, all these things that developers and landowners and people who are shaping, shaping cities are, are seeing as added value to cities and are um, seeing the demand from their clientele um, wanting these amenities before they move there. And so what's cool is that in cities like Pittsburgh, uh, which I would consider an emerging American city, um, it, uh, is that there is literally the physical space for this still. You know, the city has not built out entirely. There are large swaths of land that um, haven't been developed or were developed at one point and haven't 
been redeveloped. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity for landscape architects to be part of that conversation to help shape the functional landscape kind of foundation of a city before all the development comes on top. So, you know, if you're thinking about stormwater or um, circulation, accessibility to things like riverfronts, um, all the uh, street furniture, public art, the placement of parks, these things as landscape architects, we can have a hand in as these cities uh, grow over time. Um, and I think it's exciting because there's the physical space to do it. And I think there's the, the, um, the value add that we, we bring to the table is seen uh, in, a, in a better light more and more, which is great. Excellent. All right. Uh, the next question is not so much a question as it is a comment <laughs> from okay. Donnie Reed. He says, hi, Nina. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I'd pass that I... <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. And next is uh, from Don't Maggie Aravina. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, any advice to an emerging professional trying to relocate to another state? Move first, job later. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, in your opinion, disadvantageous to search, to job search from afar? I, I don't think it's just I don't think you're at a disadvantage. I would recommend maybe if you can if you can if you have if you can afford it to pick a, a week uh, or a three day chunk of time and go to the city where you want to go and before you go set up uh, meetings with people in different firms um, and uh, you can you know I, you can just call the office and say hi I'm interested in, <laughs> in moving to whatever city. Uh, and I'd love to talk to someone, even if you just say it's an informational, ask for an informational interview. Usually firms have somebody that do that. Um, but you could set up a series of appointments with different folks at different firms and, uh, and then go and visit. And it shows to those people who will be doing those interviews, um, it really shows a level of commitment that you're there, you're taking the time out of your schedule to come and visit the city, one, to get to know the city, but two, to have face time with firms. Um, so if you can afford it, I think it's a really great, great move. If you can't afford to go, I would suggest. Uh-oh, I think you froze up on us. <laughs> um, let me wait and let you. But you could, might time. moving too much. Is there? it back? Yes. All right. He froze on us. Okay, sorry. Um, that's ironic because I was talking about using Skype for interviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, <course. so laughs> if, if you can't afford to visit the place, I would suggest setting up meetings online with, with people and firms and get to, get to meet them over the computer. Um, it's not, you know, it, I don't think it's exactly the same as meeting people face to face, but um, it's at least a really good step and it shows your intentions uh, and your willingness to meet with someone. So that's that would be my recommendation. I think it is hard to move somewhere without a job um, just because it can take a long time. Getting a job is all about, it's it's timing on the part of, of the of the firm um, and it's it's you being prepared. So you have to be prepared 100% of the time as the individual trying to get the job. And then the firm, the timing just has to align with the type of work that they have at the moment and the need that they have. And sometimes that takes a while. I mean, uh, you know, searching for jobs is never, never easy. And, you know, coming from my experience, I applied to Sasaki multiple times and the timing was just not right. And then finally the timing was right and it worked out. Um, so it's equal, equal parts persistence and preparation on your, your part, but then also the timing on the part of the employer. Great. And if you can wait until October, go to ASLA national and you can meet yes, people from absolutely. all over. <laughs> yes. So Good plug. <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is from Chris Schlowski. Hey, Nina. Hey, I hi, Chris. I just graduated with my MLA and I'm working on my license. Is there any good advice yeah. for a person just starting their career? In general, um, that's a good big question. Uh, well, if you're working on your license, I think that's a really good first step. Um, I'm actually just now doing my licensure. I just took one and two last week, so fingers crossed. Um, and uh, I actually wish I had done it sooner because all the information is just so uh, 
necessary for day-to-day -day work as a landscape architect. So kudos to you for already starting to do that because I think that's a big first step. Um, uh, I think back to a couple of things that I've said, I, I think if you're um, looking to meet new, meet people to get a job um, or to just understand the profession and get a, maybe it's not that you want a different job, you already have a job, but you're trying to get good perspective on the profession as a whole, um, I would recommend highly volunteering with the Emerging Professionals Committee in your area for ASLA. Um, there are also other professional organizations if you want to kind of not just speak to the choir, you know, we're all landscape architects talking to one another. So that, that only goes so far. If you want to meet, you know, architects or developers or urban designers, urban planners, there are lots of other organizations that have young professionals committees or emerging professionals or emerging leader groups. Um, the Urban Land Institute, ULI, APA, the American Planning Association, AIA usually has a strong presence in most big cities. Uh, I would recommend that as a as a entry point into kind of the design profession wherever you are, and it will it'll usually carry you pretty far. Every job I've ever gotten has been through connections at ASLA, <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that can help. I don't know. There you go. The value of membership. Yeah, there you go. All right. Next question. I'm only going to use the person's first name because I don't want to get them in trouble. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I want to work at a firm specializing in ecology and or restoration, but the firm mm -hmm. I work at doesn't specialize or prioritize ecology. Is gaining experience at this firm and having longevity at the firm going to help me jump into a firm specializing in ecology, or could it hinder that? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. I think I don't think it'll hurt to stay at a place for a long period of time, but if you're not doing the work that you truly want to do and you know pretty precisely what you want to do. I think most people don't know exactly that they ha want to have a focus on a particular part of the profession. I think if you already know that um, and you know that there are firms out there that are doing that work, uh, it, I don't think it would be a bad idea to start talking to the people at those firms now if you know that you want to be um, making a move at some point. I, it's never a bad thing to be at a firm for a, a period of time to show commitment. Um, you know, it doesn't look good on a resume to work somewhere for like six months and another six months and another six months. Um, but I would also say that if you're not happy with your job or you're not doing the work that you want to do and you know that there are other opportunities out there, then you should seek those opportunities. Um, and there's some just fabulous firms out there that are doing more ecologically based work. I'm going to make another West Virginia uh, University plug for Biohabitats, which was founded by Keith Bowers, who's a uh, West Virginia University grad and doing really incredible work all across the country um, and they have offices all over the place so you could reach out to them. <laughs> all right next question Lauren Evelyn Van Vliet how much Hi, Lauren. time do you get what percentage of your work life is desk based as opposed to committee meetings or site visits? Oh, that's a good question. I, and it's totally changed since I've come to River Life. I've spent more time on a boat outside at River Life than I have <laughs> in my entire life. Uh, so I would say probably about 30% 30, 30, uh, 30 of my time is spent outside here at River Life, which isn't a ton. But when I was at Sasaki, it was probably about 15, 10 to 15%. Um, most of my time at Sasaki was spent in the office. Um, uh, and then doing, if there were events out of the office in the evenings um, downtown or something, doing that in the evenings. Um, but at River Life, because our job is very much focused on one particular geography, it's a, a little easier to go out to the site all the time. So, you know, we have weekly meetings at construction sites on multiple projects. Um, and uh, I'm, we, we give boat tours all the time, it seems like, uh, and we do walking tours and we um, are constantly bringing people to the riverfront to educate them more about the possibilities for the future. Well, that sounds tough. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> little boat. Well, you get paid. That's great. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question. This is a little bit of market research from our friends at Do More. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. What part of, in what part of your process do you pick site furnishings for a project? Oh, that's good. Uh, well, during, uh, I would say if you're picking site furnishings, you're probably doing it towards the 
end of your DD process, design development and into construction documents. And that's where you're, you know, really specifying the exact uh, site furniture that you're going to be using for a project. Um, that's when I would be doing it. <laughs> or if I have a really particular idea for something um, and I know, I know a lot of landscape architects kind of have a suite of furniture that they like to use. Um, they might know about it a little bit further in the process, but usually I would say once you're starting to finalize your construction drawing set. All right. Next question, Nathaniel Martinez asks, what strong right. skills did you feel you had and marketed when searching for a job and which ones did you feel firms were more excited about? Do you consider yeah. landscape architecture as a means for activism? So those are kind of two questions. Let's just do the, the skills one first. The first one. Okay. I know that my portfolio, which I think was a, a detriment to me at some in some interviews, um, my portfolio was much more focused on landscape architecture at an urban design scale. So most of the projects that I did in studios in undergrad and then even and then very much so in grad school because that was my focus um, were master plan level you know neighborhood scale projects um, and I didn't have a lot to show from a site design uh, standpoint so I didn't have a lot of drawing sets or grading plans or detailed drawings and that has never been my focus but I also think it I should have included more to sh should have included more of the latter to show the breadth of my skills. Because even though I don't like to do that work, I can do it. I think I should have included more of that in my portfolios um, to get my foot in the door. Because a lot of times when some a firm is hiring a landscape architect, they need you, they need to know for a fact that you can use AutoCAD, that they can hand you a set of drawings with red lines and you will pick them up. And Think uh, you froze on us again. All right, we're going to give Nina a minute to unfreeze, and uh, then we will get back to the next question. If you are on viewing us now, definitely keep asking questions, and we will get to as many as we can in our time period. Nina, are you there? Oh, I can sort of hear you. Uh-oh, I think we just lost Nina completely. She should be back on quickly, hopefully. Uh, the joys of technology. Um, so, if you are with us, stay with us. Oh, I think Nina is back. Hey, sorry. <laughs> hey, it's okay. It reduced the bandwidth, so hopefully that helps. All right. All right, let's, um, I think we got the general gist of, of that question. Let's move on to Nathania's second question. Do you consider landscape architecture as a means for activism? Activism, definitely. I, uh, and I um, strongly feel that we should be more uh, loud in our activism. <laughs> so I think in today's um, world with climate change, uh, with, uh, you know, increased uh, populations of people living in all sorts of different parts of the world um, with water shortages, with sea level rise. These are all issues that relate to the medium in which we work. And if we are not at the table being as loud as humanly possible about these issues, we will lose our chance to be the activists and the advocates that we, we can be. Um, there are many people out there who have a voice in these realms, and I think the more that landscape architects can be part of that process to show that solutions to things like sea level rise can be both functional, They're, they can protect us against water, but they can also be beautiful and they can be places that bring people together and not exclude people. Um, and I think a lot of what we talk about relates directly to issues of equity, um, and I think if we can be at the table to ensure that places are built to be inclusive and to be equitable and to be available to all and not just a few, I think uh, we can really um, strongly advocate for the value of our profession and be part of those conversations. So yes, I think we can be advocates and activists and landscape is a good medium for it. So. 
Fight the good fight. Yes. <laughs> Go Lansky Park Attacks. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Next question comes from Michael McCormick. Uh, Hi, Michael. What do you see as the greatest obstacle to development along Pittsburgh's rivers? P.S. I'm also a Yenzer from Washington, PA. <laughs> yes, <woo -hoo>. um, <laughs> And for those who don't know, a uh, Yins is a, a Yinzer is, is kind of a term for someone from Pittsburgh. Um, and it's Yins is the like local version of y'all. Instead of saying y'all going downtown, they say Yins going downtown. Um, <laughs> So it's a very local word, and I, it's funny. My cat is named Yinzi, so if that tells you anything. Um, so I, going back to the actual question, um, the uh, biggest detriment to uh, development on the riverfronts is probably land control, and um, there's still uh, not detriment. So I, I would so land control is the issue. Ma making sure there is land available next to the riverfronts that can be developed, and I think the unique opportunity that Pittsburgh has is to artfully and skillfully blend together the kind of recreational uh, amenities that people want um, with the industrial components that have made Pittsburgh Pittsburgh and what's great about Pittsburgh um, and do it in a way that all of these things can work together. And I think for a very long time, these uses have been separated um, and now we're seeing them more and more come together. And uh, it's definitely like in, in some places there's more of a rub than in others. Um, and so I think that's where to me the like, th that's the hardest part of the puzzle is getting it to work for both both types of users. And I, I think we can, like, I mean, like what I was just saying about sea level rise, we can make things that are functional, but also beautiful and places for everybody. Um, and so I, uh, that's what we're working towards uh, River Life, uh, along with many of our partners, that's what we're working towards right now. Yeah. All right. Sorry, the phone is. Hello. Phone uh, is ringing. <laughs> next question comes from Evan McNaught. Sorry if I pronounce that wrong. Evan. Hi, Evan. Uh, he says hi, Nina and Daniel. I really hi. want to take some time off after college and travel outside the country before jumping into a career. Yeah. Do you think this could make it more Do difficult it. to get a job upon returning, or would you encourage encourage students to travel after school? Go, go travel. No question. Don't even look back. Just go, tra <laughs> <laughs> go travel. Go see other places. I, I couldn't. I. This is for everybody, not just students graduating, uh, but anybody in the profession. Get out of the town in which you live in and go see other places. Um, and and seek out really successful uh, examples of, of landscape landscapes that are doing that are um, that are uh, doing the things that we we about. you know all the cities that are doing interesting things uh, with with um, stormwater with sea level rise um, go see examples of all these types of projects and seek them out and be you know you can if you want to travel, but I think if you if you want to make it um, something that actually adds to your um, overall knowledge about the profession, you can um, really strategically lay out a trip so that you can kind of see all these great places and learn from them. There's nothing better than traveling and seeing seeing other places and kind of taking mental notes or you know starting a blog and recording it. And um, so I'd highly recommend it. Tough question. Following up on that. I hate when people ask okay. me, what's your favorite places that you have traveled? I mean, what, what are the best places you've been? Yeah. Uh, well, so so recently, so my husband and I, before we um, moved to Pittsburgh, we did a big road trip through the U.S., through like the eastern part of the U.S., and that was incredible to see so much of the United States in one chunk of time. Uh, I visited some of the places that we went to. We went to um, Cincinnati, we went to Louisville, we went to Nashville, we were in Savannah and Charleston. And I'd been to a couple of those places individually, but then seeing them all back to back was really interesting just in this point in time. Um, so that was great. And that was in our own backyard. And then we also, we just went to Amsterdam uh, last year, which was awesome. April was just a perfect time to be there. Um, the canals and the uh, just the, the way the city is set up and how like tight knit it is. Um, also, Barcelona is beautiful. Um, was there a couple years ago, but going to Toronto soon, and then I'll be in France in the fall. So that's exciting. Oh. Kind of mapping out a trip to see some classic landscapes. 
Excellent. All right, yeah. I'm going to ask you uh, another question here. What is your favorite project you have ever worked on? Oh, man. Um, that's a good question. Uh, well, so one the first built work project I worked on was the Lawn on D in Boston. Um, and uh, although I have, I have lots of favorite projects, uh, this project was a really incredible experience. Um, and the Lawn on D is a... Uh, it's a temporary, well, supposedly a temporary park in Boston that was built next to the convention center. So our client was the, the convention center authority in Boston, and they were expanding the convention center, and they wanted to double the convention center's size. And as part of that, they wanted to build a park for the community. Um, but through the community process, it became clear that the, that the timeline was very long for the construction process, and the community really wanted a park sooner rather than later, and they'd been promised a park. And so the design team, we as the design team at Sasaki and our partners at Util, um, we came up with this idea of a temporary park that we could build relatively quickly with relatively inexpensive materials, some asphalt and some lawn, and we could build a park within the next 13 weeks and uh, have it ready for that summer, and we could test out ideas for what the final park would be. Um, and we did it. We, uh, you know, we got a contractor, and and the convention center uh, worked around the clock to build this park, and it debuted, and it has been a wild success with a relatively minimal uh, uh, budget. Um, and there's a bar in in the park. There's like a tent, and there's a bar, and there are lawn games and really cool swings that are like adult swings by Howler and Yoon. And last year, there were over 200,000 people visited this park. Um, and it's very simple. There's not much to it in the way of the landscape, but we created a really smart framework for everything else to happen on top, for the food trucks to come in, for the bar to be set up, for the light installations, for the art and all this stuff. And um, for me, it, that's my favorite project because it, it reminded me that what we do is relatively simple which is awesome. Um, and if we do it really well and we can do it simply, we can create a space that uh, is very successful with not a lot. And I think it's a great example. Um, it's not appropriate for every application of landscape architecture, but I think it's a really great example of temporary projects helping to build momentum towards longer term change in a neighborhood. And, and this has just totally helped to transform the neighborhood um, that it's in. And it was a fun project. The team was incredible. Um, shout out to all my Sasakians. Uh, and it was, uh, it was just a great experience. So that would probably be my favorite project. <laughs> it is a very cool project. I've been there, love it. Yeah. Yeah. Moving yeah. on that same train of thought, talking about being able to yeah. quickly transform a space when you spoke at yeah. the MASH recently, you talked about a project you were involved in. I, I don't remember the fancy name for it, but basically a park that's pulled by a bike and can be set up anywhere. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Kit that's of great. Parks. Sure. Um, so that's Kit of Parks. Uh, and I'm, I've been working on that with my uh, partner, Philip Dugdale. He's a, he's a landscape designer at, or an associate at, um, at Sasaki. And uh, Originally, actually, this was a project for ASLA, for the Boston chapter of ASLA, um, and it is a mobile uh, park, and so we called it Kit of Parks, so it's a, a mobile kit of pieces, a kit of parts to build a park, and it's bright yellow, and it rides on a little trailer on the back of a bike, and you can pull it around anywhere and set it up, and there are lawn games, there's like a beanbag toss set, there's a Jenga set, um, there's a table, like a high top table and some stools, and then some building blocks. And uh, originally we built it um, for a, a convention or a, a, for a conference that the BSLA was attending. And we built it as a teaching tool to show people what landscape architecture is all about. Um, and we didn't just want to pass them a little pamphlet. We wanted to show them in a physical form. And so um, they had a small budget and we made the kit on the CNC router at Sasaki. Um, it's made out of foam. And, uh, so, and then we debuted it at the, at the convention. And then since then we like biked it around to different places. And then uh, last year, um, we decided to submit it for the Kaboom Play Everywhere Challenge, which is a Kaboom's like a national play nonprofit, and they build playgrounds all the time. They do like 
playground builds in a weekend and they're incredible. And they did a challenge called the Play Everywhere Challenge where they asked people to submit ideas for how to play in kind of unexpected, how to introduce play in unexpected places like bus stops or vacant lots. And so we thought this would be perfect. And so we submitted it and we partnered with the Boston Parks and Rec Department and um, uh, the Franklin Park Coalition. Franklin Park's a really amazing park in Boston. Um, and the Mayor's Office of Urban Mechanics, which is a cool little department that does kind of like prototyping tests and the BSLA. And we submitted it and we won. So we got money to make another kit of parks um, and we're making this one out of a harder uh, foam with a plastic, so it's much more durable. Um, the first one was kind of our prototype, and this one will be more permanent. And um, it will be debuting in Franklin Park in May. So we're really excited. Um, we'll be out and about for the Kite and Bike Festival in Boston in May. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we can bring lots of little kits of parks to lots of places. So if anybody's interested, we, <laughs> we have them. <laughs> Where can yeah. they go to find more information on that? Is it on a website somewhere? Uh, so, well, we we actually we now own kidofparks.com, um, and we're we're building that website, but we don't have it built yet. But if you email me um, it, or go to my website, which is ninachase.com, you can find a little bit more info about it. Yeah. All right, that's cool. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk about. We talked about your favorite project ever. Yeah. What's oh, no. the worst project you've ever worked on? Why you just couldn't wait for it to be done, and why? Oh no. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. What is the worst project? I don't know what the worst project would be. <laughs> that's good. Uh, that's probably a good thing that I don't have worst project. I mean, I I remember in school wanting you know the portfolio review to be over as fast as humanly possible, but that wasn't really a project. Uh, Ever have a, a honestly, challenging have a client project. experience? Uh, challenging client experience. Well, um, probably, you know, I think there's been a shift in how some projects are managed. Um, and so when there are interesting management structures, I think that's always really tough. When you have a client who might outsource the management of a project to somebody else and then they're managing with other people and it feels like there are 20 people removed from the actual end results, that has been hard. And I think as, as landscape architects, since we're often sub consultants for architects um, and we're not the prime consultant, um, we can get kind of shoved down the ladder in the decision making hierarchy. Um, and I found that to be, that can be really challenging if you're not able to really voice what you want to voice to the right people and it has to filter through multiple channels. Um, so I think as much as we can try to be on teams and partner with others who are creating teams where landscape architects are of equal consideration or um, aren't buried underneath 20 other sub consultants. Uh, I think that helps so much. I mean, any project is only as good as the client um, because they're the ones who own the land. They're the ones who are hiring you. We're a professional service industry. So, you know, we have to, we, we answer to clients and, and we, and that's, that's the only way that you can get a really good project built is if, if you have a really good client. Um, and so making sure that that communication is good is uh, pretty imperative. All right. We have another viewer question and Excellent. we, we might've sort of covered some of this, but uh, let's give it a shot anyway. Um, howdy. Uh, from Leo Lopez. Hi, Howdy. I'm a student at Texas A&M. What advice Excellent. do you have for students pursuing a degree in landscape architecture? He admits this may be a very broad question, but uh, maybe talk yeah. about um, what's the most important thing you learned while you were getting your degree or, or what was the most important? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think what is really helpful is to get as much exposure to different facets of the profession as possible. So whether that's in school, uh, you know, taking electives uh, where you can focus on projects of, a, of different scales, maybe there's a design build class that you could take and you could actually learn how to build something. Uh, or if there's a planning studio, you could learn uh, more about planning and how landscape architects can play a vital role in planning. Um, or if it's uh, just, ex getting internship experience, um, whether that's working for a design build company locally uh, or working for a developer or working for a really tiny firm or a really gigantic firm. I think 
exposing yourself uh, to lots of different facets of the profession will allow you to really understand where your strengths are and the type of work that you would like to continue doing. Um, and once you have that perspective, you can really make that choice and know that that's, that's what you're interested in doing. And so I would, I'd encourage you to do that not only in your studios, but outside, outside of the studio um, with, with internships and, and jobs and even just volunteering. Yeah. All right. Um, we have one, one more comment <laughs> from a viewer. Okay. Which I, I think you'll appreciate from Philip McHenry. He says, represent hashtag WVU. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Philip. How are you? <laughs> All right. That's we are nearing the top of the hour. We have about four minutes left. So I'm just going to open it up to you to offer any closing comments you might have, uh, any last minute sure. advice or, or whatever. And then, uh, yeah, unless any last minute phenomenal question comes in here, we will, uh, we'll wrap it up. So, uh, over wrap to you. It well, first I just, I want to say thank you to ASLA. This is again, just a great program, a really nice way to introduce people to different, did the different facets of landscape architecture and, Thanks to everybody who joined in. I appreciate it. It's been it's been fun. I know I, I can't see you, so I don't know what's going on out there. But um, thank you for for joining us today. Um, I would encourage you know I, I I couldn't be more proud to be a landscape architect. And I think what's exciting right now, like I've said, is that the value of landscape architecture is being um, seen and and brought to the table more and more. And so. I'm excited uh, to be in the profession. I think this is a new age uh, where where we can really have a say in how our cities are shaped, um, and we can all be part of that, which is a pretty powerful position to be in. So um, I, I encourage you all to stick with it. Uh, it can get tough. The hours are long. Everything takes three times as long as you think it will, um, but I swear it's worth it. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'd love to have you in the profession if you, if you stay with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and, and excited to see what everybody else does um, in their future. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Nina. We are so glad you were with us and phenomenal Thanks. job. Thanks, Thanks for asking, Thanks. answering all these questions. Uh, hopefully to Good our pleasure. viewers, you, uh, you learned something interesting, something that will help you as you proceed through your studies and your early career. And to all the students and emerging professionals that joined us, we appreciate you encourage you to become members in ASLA if you're not already and to maintain that membership through your whole career. I mean, as you've heard today from Nina, the networking opportunities, the volunteer opportunities, uh, chances to grow and expand yourself as well as your network, I think uh, are definitely the major contributing factor to being a member, not to mention all the great things ASLA is doing on your behalf with advocacy yep. and uh, promoting the profession and things like that. So with that, we are going to wrap up. Thank you once again, and we will see you Thank next you. time. Be sure to watch out for emails or information on uh, ASLA social media for when the next Ask Me Anything event will be. Have a great day.